this. Hello and welcome to this recording of a, of a revision guide to the Shakespeare text A Macbeth. Pause the video here then to look how you could use this video to help your revision. Um, the least useful thing is just to sit and watch it. Uh, please be ready to pause the video and make notes as and when you need to. So today's video is going to focus on the nemesis of Macbeth then. That is Macduff, otherwise known as the Thane of Fife. Uh, see the arrow of where in Scotland Fife actually is. As and all, we're going to be looking at the assessment criteria, understanding what the play is about, and of course its language, its form, and its structure. As you can see then, this is the hierarchy in Macbeth's time. We've got Duncan, voice of God, at the top there. We've got his two sons, the princes, Malcolm and Donalbane. Um, then we have the nobility, or the lords there, Macbeth, and equal to him, Macduff. It is noticeable then that Macduff, Macduff and Macbeth are equal in terms of power. They both have uh, a wife there, Lady Macbeth in this case, but Macduff is lucky enough to have a son who's murdered about halfway through the play. As normal, it's good to know a bit about the chain of being. If there's something that is something that you're not quite sure about, please pause the video and read the information through. And Macduff is a thane, equal in power and responsibility then to Macbeth. He would come under nobles on the diagram on the board. If you're unsure what a thane is, uh, a thane is a man who held land granted by the king or the military, uh, ranking between an ordinary freeman and a hereditary noble. In Scotland, then, um, a thane would actually be a chief of a clan um, who held land under the Scottish king. Now, Macduff comes from quite a well-known family, um, as you can read there on the board, um, that was a real family in, Scot um, in Scotland at the time Shakespeare was writing, and indeed in the 14th century when the play is set. Um, and they were, however, well known for being a family who had their own rules, um, who conducted themselves um, as maybe a little bit apart from the rest of Scotland. A group of people then that were almost isolated um, and then only obeyed um, the their laws then not from the king of Scots, um, but, but, but simply by the grace of God. From this history then we could view Macduff then as being more loyal to God than anybody else. The themes, well where does Macduff fit in? Well we know he is a powerful character, he is somebody who takes on Macbeth and wins. Um, we know that he links to violence um, in the way, of course, he chops off Macbeth's head at the end. Um, and he also is a man full of free will. He is somebody then who does what he wants to do for the good of the country rather than perhaps for his own ambitions. Some key words for Macduff. We've got discoverer, outraged, a family man. He cares a great deal for his wife and son. He is trusted by all those around him. Um, and he seems to be one of the more human or emotive characters, uh, particularly, obviously, when he finds out when his wife and son have died. What does Shakespeare want us to remember Macduff for? Well, he's the man who leads the English army to Macbeth's castle and ultimately kills him. What does Shakespeare tell us about Macduff? He's noble. He's wise. He's judicious. He best knows, and he's seen as a good man, which would lead us to a paragraph like this. Shakespeare deliberately makes Macduff into a typical thane. He is noble and wise, which implies he is a good, well-respected thane. We are told by Ross, a fellow lord, that he best knows, which implies we can trust Macduff's judgment to make the right choices. In many ways, he's presented by Shakespeare as a younger Duncan. Macduff even leaves his own son and wife in order to help Malcolm restore the chain of being. In many ways, we could call Macduff then the nemesis of Macbeth. In many ways, Macduff is Macbeth's nemesis. This is a particular type of character. 
Traditionally, this means enemy, but it comes from ancient Greece. In ancient Greek mythology, the nemesis is the character who restores the chain of being. This links to the idea of equal and opposite forces cancelling each other out. This is what happens in Macbeth. You have the good or great Duncan, um, sorry, the good or great Macduff, taking on the evil, corrupt Macbeth. When they die, obviously, equality um, and the way of life in Scotland is restored. For everything Macbeth does that is evil, Macbeth does his evil, Macduff does something equally good in reply. What does uh, Macduff represent? Well, through Macduff, uh, Shakespeare challenges us to explore what it means to be masculine, think about what betrayal and revenge can do to you, and think about the theme of patriotism. The first time we see Macduff then is in Act 2, Scene 3, and then onward into Act 2, Scene 4. Macduff arrives at the castle to wake Duncan. Macduff's duty is to wake the king. Macduff is shocked when he discovers the king's death. He feels evil spirits have taken over the castle. He cares deeply for King Duncan, is in shock after his death. And Macduff tells us that Malcolm and Donald Bain have fled and makes them suspects. Macduff worries about the future and refuses to go to Macbeth's coronation, instead going to Fife. So as soon as good King Duncan dies, here comes Macduff to take his place as the good character. This then equals the fact he is Macbeth's nemesis. Let's take a look then at the appearance of Macduff um, as he reports the murder of Duncan. Most sacrilegious murder that broke up the Lord's anointed temple and stole thence. The life of the building. What is it you say? The life. Me knew his majesty. Approach the chamber. Destroy your sight with a new Gorgon. Do not big haste. Speak. See and then speak yourselves. Awake! Awake! Bring the alarm bell! Murder and treason! Banquan Dolbein! Malcolm! Awake! Shake off this downy sleep, death's counterfeit, and look on death itself. It's interesting that he mentions Banquo first, before calling the king's own sons. It shows how good uh, Banquo is as perhaps the man that Macduff trusts the most. Let's take a look at some of the key scenes then from uh, Macduff, um, analysing the language, form and structure. We can see here then from Macduff's oh horror, 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 the Macduff is in shock suggesting to us that Duncan was not only important to him, but he loved him. Horror is repeated and shouted to exaggerate the cruelty of the crime. Sacrilegious forced us to accept the murder was an act against God. Macduff is concerned about Scotland. Duncan is a personification of a nation. This gives us the image of Duncan holding Scotland together as a home for the Scottish people. This emphasises Macduff's patriotism. Shakespeare is referencing Medusa uh, from the Greek mythology. This suggests to us that Macduff is able to look on Duncan's body and live. Medusa turns everybody she sees into stone. This foreshadows his greatness later. Shakespeare confronts us with the image that Duncan's death is beginning, the beginning of hell for Scotland. And Shakespeare introduces us to the theme of resurrection. We know this is particularly important for Banquo, but Malcolm also metaphorically rises from a weak son to a strong king. Let's look at this key quote then. Confusion hath now made his masterpiece, spoken of course by Macduff. Shakespeare references the witches here as agents of chaos. 
This represents what happens after Duncan's death as we witness Scotland descend into anarchy and chaos. The verb here, made, is important as it confronts us with the realisation that Duff, Macduff knows that, it, it, that this is a plan. MacDuncan was killed by design. This implies that Macduff will automatically look for who is responsible. The possessive pronoun his challenges us to think that Macduff already suspects Macbeth as the witches are female. It's his masterpiece after all. The noun masterpiece forces us to think that Duncan's death is the most evil act that could happen. Nothing can be worse than the death of God's voice. This could also be viewed as a backhanded compliment to Macbeth, and Lady Macbeth is a great artist. Some key quotes then from this scene. The next time we meet him is in Act 4, Scene 2. Lady Macduff thinks Macbeth is going to England is madness. Lady Macduff would rather her husband was dead uh, rather than be a traitor. They are warned that their lives are in danger. And Macduff's son is murdered, and Lady Macduff is murdered off stage. As Macbeth's tyrannical rule and paranoia deepens, innocent lives are threatened as we meet Lady Macduff and her son for the first time. What had he done to make him fly the land? You must have patience, madam. He had none. His flight was madness. Well, our actions do not. Our fears do make us traitors. You know not whether it was his wisdom or his fear. Wisdom? To leave his wife, to leave his babes, his mansion and his titles. In a place from whence himself does fly. He loves us not. He wants the natural touch. For the poor wren, the most diminutive of birds, will fight her loved ones in her nest against the owl. All is the fear and nothing is the love. As little as the wisdom when the flight so runs against all reason. My dearest Kurt, I pray you, school yourself. But for your husband, he is noble, wise, judicious, and best knows the fits of the season. I dare not speak much further. But cruel are the times when we are traitors and do not know ourselves. When we hold rumour from what we fear, yet know not what we fear, but float upon a wild and violent sea each way and move. I take my leave of you. It shall not be long ere I'll be here again. Things at the worst will cease, or else climb upward to what they were before. My pretty cousin, blessing upon you. Father he is, and yet he's fatherless. I am so much a fool should I stay longer. It will be my disgrace and your discomfort. I take my leave, at once. Sir. Your father's dead. And what will you do now? How will you live? As birds do, mother. My father's not dead for all your sins. Yes, he is dead. How wilt thou do for a father? Nay, how will you do for a husband? Why, well, I can buy me twenty at any market. Was my father a traitor, mother? Aye, that he was. What is a traitor? Why, well, one that swears and lies. And be all traitors that do so? Everyone that does so is a traitor and must be hanged. And must they all be hanged that swear and lie? Everyone. Who must hang them? Why the honest men? Then the liars and swears are fools. For there are liars and swears enough to beat the honest men and hang up them. <laughs> now God help thee. Poor monkey. I doubt some danger does approach you nearly. Be not found here. 
hands with your little ones. To frighten you thus with it, I am too savage. To do worse to you a fell cruelty which is too nigh your person. Heaven preserve you. I dare abide no longer. Oh, whither should I fly? I have done no harm. But I remember now. I am in this earthly world where to do harm is often laudable. To do good, sometime accounted dangerous folly. Why then, alas, do I put up that womanly defense to say I have done no harm? Where's your husband? I hope in no place so unsanctified where such as thou mayst find him. He's a traitor. Now lie, so shall it villain! What? You, eh? Huh? He has killed me, mother. Run up to where I pray you. Lady Murdoff is a stereotypical woman of the era. In many ways, she's like Banquo, and the two characters both strive to look after their sons, but fail. This allows us to see Macbeth as a killer of innocent children of Scotland, and so the killer of Scotland's future. Lady Macduff is a foil for Lady Macbeth, as she's everything Lady Macbeth isn't. And Lady Macbeth knows it in her final minutes. She references how the Thane of Fife had a wife, where is she now? Shakespeare has Lady Macbeth, Macduff symbolise all the virtues of women of the era. She is loyal, supportive, cares deeply for her husband's safety, and is the teacher to her son. However, both are let down by their husbands. Lady Macbeth because Macbeth is too feminine, and Lady Macduff because her man is too manly. What is Shakespeare trying to say about the whole role of women at the time? In the Middle Ages, a woman's duty was to be a wife, a housekeeper, and a mother. Men were the superior gender, and they were entitled to beat their wife if she misbehaved. The women of the Middle Ages were dominated by the male members of their family. The women were expected to obey their father, but also their brothers and any other male members of their family. Any disobedient girls were beaten and it was seen as a crime against religion. Even the church was anti-woman, and it saw women as agents of the devil, tempting men into sin. Yet the upper class ideal of courtly love painted women as models of virtue. Women got married as young as 11 or 12. Few married for love, though it often developed later. A child's future husband or wife was chosen by the parents with the aim of increasing the family's property. The church did not accept divorce, though marriages were occasionally annulled. The wife could not own property, therefore it belonged to her husband. Nuns lived in convents, also known as nunneries. They housed communities of higher class women who belonged to a religious order and took the same kind of vows as monks. A well-known nun was Marie de Bourbon, who was the sister of the Queen of France at the time. If a woman did not want to get married, entering a convent was the only alternative. Some nunneries were very poor, but nuns like monks often bent the strict rules of the order and lived a fairly comfortable life. Women often married older men, and the women tended to live longer, so they became widows. As widows, they were entitled to inherit their husbands' estates. Some remained as heads of the household after their husbands had died. A rich widow could usually find another husband if she wanted, or she could become a nun. Most married couples tried to produce lots of children because only one in four survived early childhood. Childhood was short in the Middle Ages. From age seven, most children started work or began to train in craft. Boys usually left home while girls stayed at home and learned domestic skills and crafts from their mothers. Women, even ones with servants, had a lot of work to do, running the household and supervising the children. 
Besides cooking and cleaning, a woman had to spin yarn from wool and weave it into cloth, which she made into clothes. The distaff, which was a stick that held yarn, became a symbol for the female gender. The best known playwright was the German nun Frau Suitha, who lived in the 10th century. By 1300, women could read and write, often in Latin and French. A famous writer was Christine de Pisson. After her husband's death, she made a living as a professional writer, something that was extremely rare in the days before printing existed in Europe. She wrote several books defending the rights of women. The appearance of a noble woman during the Middle Ages was important. A woman aged quickly during this era because she had so many children. The diet of noble women during the Middle Ages lacked vitamin C, which resulted in bad teeth and bleeding gums. To hold the appearance of youth, a noble woman of the Middle Ages occasionally even dyed her hair yellow with a mixture of saffron, cumin seed, salandine, and oil. Face makeup was applied to obtain a pale look, which was very desirable. A pale face meant that you were rich and did not have to work. The education of noble women in the Middle Ages did not focus on academic studies. Young noble women, as young as seven, would be sent away from their home to live with another noble family. There she would be taught a range of subjects and skills. Manners and etiquette were of prime importance, including how to find a noble husband. Time would be spent learning how to dance and ride. Archery was also taught to young noble women. Some housewives' responsibilities, such as preserving fruits and household management, would be taught to prepare them for their duties as a married woman. Young noble women would also be taught the principles of the medieval code of chivalry and courtly love, and would join the spectators at jousting tournaments. A little scene then from this particular part of the play. Lady Macduff doesn't understand why Macduff left. This gives us the image of a supporting, loving wife. Shakespeare repeats his theme of insanity and irrational thought here. Lady Macduff fails to understand the patriotic act actions of her husband, Macduff, and the short sentence here suggests to us her anger at, her le at his leaving. Shakespeare forces us to see Macduff in a new light. He's betrayed his wife and child and seems to be committing treason against the new king after he refuses to go to his coronation. Lady Macduff is aware how dangerous this is and appears to blame Macduff for endangering those he loves most, the opposite of how Lady Macbeth acted. This then is a key quote from her, his flight, that's Macduff, Macduff's flight was madness. Shakespeare explores the precarious position Macduff was in. He has a choice to protect the country he loves or stay and protect his wife and child. We see him make the ultimate sacrifice by choosing his country as every soldier would. Shakespeare confronts us with the verb flight, which suggests to us that Macduff's instinct was to protect Scotland, who he sees as a mother. But he also implies cowardice as he seemingly runs from a fight with Macbeth. Macduff's masculinity is questioned by his wife, which serves as a connection to Macbeth. Here, however, it is unfounded. Macduff is seen as mad, as others do not comprehend the choice he made. Some key quotes then from Lady Macbeth, or sorry, uh, Lady Macduff, um, to um, or about his, her wife, his, her husband, sorry. The next time we see Macduff then is Act 4, Scene 3. In England, Macduff and Malcolm discuss if they should help fight against Macbeth. Malcolm says he has troops, but is not a good enough man to lead them. Macduff disagrees, but says that Malcolm cannot rule if he's that bad. Malcolm tells him it was a test and he was lying to him and that actually Macduff is a patriot for wanting the best for Scotland. Ross says that Scotland is suffering under Macbeth and that Macduff's wife and child are fine. Malcolm tells Macduff that he has an invasion force ready. Ross reveals that actually Macduff's family are in fact dead. Macduff grieves for them and wants revenge. Some key quotes then from this scene. Shakespeare has Macduff care more about the crown than the man who wears it. This suggests to us that Macduff is a patriot of Scotland. The now unhappy contrasts Macbeth Scotland with the much more pleasant reign of Duncan. Shakespeare makes a political statement here about the pretenders to the royal throne being vultures who simply live off others' success. Macduff is saying that many women will fall at Malcolm's feet if he were king. 
but states a true king wouldn't allow themselves to be corrupted. Macduff forces us to reflect on the responsibilities a good and trusted king has and how these should not be abused. Shakespeare personifies Scotland and says she is miserable. Shakespeare uses personification repeatedly to give us the image of Scotland as a mother to its citizens, whilst the king is the father. Shakespeare exaggerates Duncan's holy qualities as he repeatedly juxtaposes Macbeth's reign with Duncan. This forces us to see Macbeth as a tyrant and a man unfit to rule. Macduff reveals to us that Malcolm's mother appeared to die in childbirth. The tone here suggests an admiration for a woman and the act of birth. This foreshadows the reveal that Macduff was not of woman born later in the play. Malcolm gives us the image of Macduff as a child of integrity, which reinforces the image of Macduff as a great, true, loyal, good man. Macduff embodies all the qualities that make a king, apart from ambition. The noun child also allows us to view Macduff as a man born from Macduff, Macbeth's rule. He would have been a great man if it wasn't Macbeth, um, as he would have no one to hate or kill. Shakespeare suggests to us a more aggressive Macduff as he begins his journey to Macbeth. He speaks in statements and commands. Ross appears unusually blunt given the news he's giving when he's telling Macduff about the death of his wife and child. The awfulness of the crime is exaggerated through the sibilance savagely slaughtered, which helps us see Macbeth as a butcher or an animal. Shakespeare forces us to imagine the horrible crimes committed as Macduff asks repeated questions to Ross to find out in more detail. As an audience, we don't want to hear the detail of the atrocities committed. Shakespeare repeats the word all four times here to allow us to empathise with Macduff and the enormity of the crime that's being committed against him. We need to understand this as it is the main catalyst for Macduff wanting to kill Macbeth at the end. You to some single breast, and no mind that's honest, but in it shares some woe, though the main part pertain. You to some single breast, and no mind that's honest, but in it shares some woe, though the main part pertains to you alone. If it be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly, let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue forever which shall possess them with the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. Ah, I guess at it. Your castle is surprised, your wife and babe savagely slaughtered. To relate the manner where on the quarry of these murdered deer to add the death of you. Merciful heaven. What man never pull your hat upon your brows? Give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break. My children, too. Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. And I must be from thence. My wife killed, too. I have said. Be comforted. Let's make us medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. He has no children. All my pretty ones. Did you say all? Oh. Hell. Cut. All. What? All my pretty chickens and their dam at one fell. Some key quotes then from this scene. And last we have Act 5, Scenes 7 and 8. Macduff arrives at Macbeth's castle and refuses to fight anyone apart from Macbeth. Macduff finds Macbeth and challenges him. Macbeth says he cannot be killed by one of women born. Macduff tells him he was a, he was a, Caesar, a Caesarian. Macbeth refuses to fight and Macduff threatens him with captivity. Macbeth refuses and fights Macduff. Macbeth dies. Macduff is thought missing but appears with Macbeth's head. He is the first to say Malcolm is now King of Scotland. Look tightly to a stake. I cannot fly but bear like. I must fight the course. 
Potsky, that was not born of woman. Such a one might have fear. Or none. Tyrant, show thy face. If thou beest slain and with no stroke of mine, my wife and children's ghosts will haunt me still. I cannot strike a wretched kern whose arms are hired to bear their staves. Either thou, Macbeth, or else my sword of an unbattered edge I sheath again undeeded. Fortune let me find him, and more I beg not. Make all our trumpets speak. Give them all breath. Why should I play the Roman fool? I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. Turn, hellhound. Turn. Of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I have no words. My voice is in my sword! The slave Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear the charm of life, which was not yield to one of woman born. Despair thy charm, and let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. Cursed be that tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. And be these juggling fiends no more believed. The palter with us in a double sense, and keep the word of promise to our ear, but break it to our hope. I'll not fight with thee. Then yield thee, coward, and live. To be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have thee as our rare amongst us are, painted upon a pole, and under it, here may you see the tyrant. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet. The Burnham would become to dance in an, and thou opposed being of no woman born. Yet I will try the last. Lay on. Make death. <laughs> Him who first cries, hold. Enough. Enter, sir, the castle. I would the friends we lack were safe arrived. Macduff is missing. Hail, King, for so thou art. The time is free. Hail, King of Scotland. Hail, King. As we now study then some key scenes, uh, key parts of that scene. Here we have then Shakespeare has Macduff seeking retribution for not only his family's death, but also Banquo's. By doing this, we're forced to see Macduff as representing justice for all of Macbeth's crimes. 
Macduff refuses to fight the mercenaries that Macbeth has paid to fight for him. This lets us see Macduff as pure as he won't kill innocent men. He even says he will put away his sword rather than kill anyone else. This is once again the opposite to the way Macbeth fights. Shakespeare contrasts the gods Macbeth follows with Macduff's. Fortune is capitalised suggests that Macduff is praying here to the true god to help him find the sinner, Macbeth. Shakespeare turns a fight between men into a fight between good and evil. Shakespeare has Macduff give orders to a king, yet puts Macbeth at the bottom of the chain of being by calling him a hound or dog. This forces us to reflect on how much Macbeth has fallen since the start of the play. Shakespeare contrasts Macduff's lack of words and refusal to speak with Macbeth's soliloquies earlier in the play. Macduff is presented as a man who isn't sneaky or two-faced. He tells the truth to those around him. Shakespeare has Macduff speak in the third person to imply he's more than a man. He is the saviour of Scotland. The verb ripped implies the violence of Macduff's birth, that Macduff survived and reminds us that Macduff is a brave warrior and hard to beat. Macbeth simply cannot beat Macduff, as Macduff is an honourable man. Here are some key quotes then from the end of the play. What does Shakespeare want us to think? Shakespeare presents Macduff as the antithesis of Macbeth. He's loyal and trusted, a great fighter and serves the crown. He has no ambition and is driven by justice to avenge his family in Scotland. As the play progresses, Shakespeare builds the character's goodness to an almost mythical level to echo Greek myth mythological heroes. Shakespeare wants us to cheer and applaud Macduff as a good, pure hero who restores the monarchy to its rightful place. Here then on these next screens are the key quotes of Macduff and what you'd say about them. Please freeze the screen in the appropriate time um, so you can make notes. This is the beginning of the play. Then we have the middle of the play. And then we have the end of the play. Now, if we look closely at all the language we've talked about today, you'll notice that Shakespeare uses certain words to describe Scotland, uh, the background picture of Dunstane Castle. Throughout the play, Shakespeare uses either, metaphorical, either a metaphorical image of Scotland as a home or the personification of Scotland as a mother. This helps us imagine Scotland as something more than a country and almost a character in its own right. Macduff appears to view Scotland as a surrogate mother, a land that raised and shaped him. Shakespeare does this to foreshadow the revealing, tra revealing tragedy at the end of the play. Macduff's own mother was died in childbirth. This helps justify his extreme patriotic attitude. It also contributes to Macduff's moral code and extreme violent anger when his own child and wife are killed. Now we're going to move on to essay skills. We'd be given then an extract like the one here, and the question might be, what can you tell about Macduff and the best relationship at this point? Of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I have no words. My voice is in my sword. Thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. Loses labour. <laughs> as easy mayst thou the entrenchant air with thy keen sword impress as make me breathe. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear a charming life which must not yield to one a woman born. Despair thy child and let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. A curse be that tongue that tells me so. For it hath cowed my better part of man. And be these juggling fiends no more believed that porter with us in a double sense, that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. I'll not fight with thee. Yield thee, coward! 
and live to be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have thee as our rarer monsters are painted upon a pole and not. We know the examiner wants you to show that you understand how and why characters react to each other, the different emotions the characters are going through and why, and how the relationship develops through the extract. You should not be repeating the same answer all the way through. Common errors that are made. Not making enough points. It'd be very easy just to make three points here. You need a lot more than that. Forgetting to make clear that this is a play and not showing the relationship grows, changes or develops in each part of the script you've been given. Your essay plan would include a short overview, then the start, middle and end of the extract. Where you divide it is up to you. So here's how I'd write it. I start off with an overview. At this point in the play, Shakespeare as his hero and villain confront each other. The audience would anticipate the vicious battle between good and evil. I would then talk about the start of the extract, which I've called the outset here. You can see there I've used lots of quotes and then used my key language um, to describe those quotes, like suggest to us, imply, allows us to reflect on, suggest to us, and we witness. Plenty of links then to the reader here. Notice I've used several quotes there and explained what I can tell about the characters based on them, um, and I've begun to analyse the language here and, and the tone of voice being used as well. This then would be the middle of the extract and the kind of sentences I'd use there, showing how the extract develops or the uh, relationship between the two men changes. Um, feel free to pause the video and see if you can complete these sentences. And lastly, by the end of the extract, I would look at the conclusion. What has happened by the end? What has changed? And my answer might well involve answering some of the questions on the board. 1B will ask you to answer about the play as a whole. In this case, the theme of good and evil. This is a full response then. Um, I would need a brief overview, beginning of the play, middle of the play and end of the play. I could talk about Macbeth and Macduff here. I could talk about good and evil in the form of Macbeth and Banquo, Macbeth and Duncan, and of course Lady Macbeth and Lady Macduff could also be in with a shout. Please pause the video then and make notes on this essay um, so that you can write it from memory, either in the exam or as a good practice. This is the beginning of my essay, then going on to the middle, and obviously my last two paragraphs. Look how many quotes I've used here. I've really memorised these and thought and remembered exactly what I would write about each one, and that comes through practice. Some last notes then on Macduff. Freeze the screen um, and make notes from the screen on the board there. And thank you very much then for listening to this video on the character of Macduff.